Hello, I'm Stephen Wellman. I'm here at Intel Software. I'm here today with James Reinders from Intel. James, uh, thank you so much for joining us here for our interview for Go Parallel. James, you presented at length this morning a great deal of material on uh, the future of parallel software development, some of the new tools available. I was hoping perhaps you could give our audience on Go Parallel a little bit of a recap of your presentation this morning. I'd be happy to. So what I talked about was uh, I was thinking about this question I get asked, which is, is parallel programming going to catch on? And, and people ask, well, you've been telling people they should write parallel programs for a while. I don't see a lot of them. It must be a failure. Why do you keep thinking it's going to catch on? And so what I did is I talked a little bit about four different areas that I see that are really um, helping grease the skids, if you will, keep things moving. Uh, those, those four areas were better programming tools, uh, better programming models, uh, lots more parallelism in the hardware itself, and better ways of teaching and learning about parallelism. And I, I went over these four areas, uh, what I see happening, uh, some of the things that I'm participating in, working with at Intel. Uh, these are trends that I see happening around the industry, not just at Intel, uh, that really give rise to parallel programming being uh, more approachable, more sustainable in the future than it ever has been in the past. We've heard a lot about the Atom processor at this year's event, unlike, say, at previous events, and the sort of holistic approach to multi-core and uh, parallel software development. Can you talk a little bit about how developers might think more holistically about parallel software development, moving all the way from uh, Xeon and Xeon Phi all the way down to the Atom? Yeah, I think it's a, a really important part of our message. Uh, w we look at the diversity in hardware, uh, the having Atom processors in uh, battery-operated devices and other embedded situations, all the way up to ZN5s that help power uh, not only some of the most powerful uh, supercomputers in the world, but some of the most power-efficient computers in the world. Um, and the question becomes, should all of these have different programming languages, different programming models? Uh, uh, and the reality is, is that a lot of software benefit is derived if we can keep the programming methods similar. And so we've really taken an approach of looking at what can we do so that our hardware designs don't make the situation worse than it needs to be. So we, we do, we can support the same programming models and methods and tools and parallel programming models uh, across all of these, uh, even though the hardware itself may have radically different amounts of parallelism. You may have Atom cores with uh, just a few threads of parallelism, or Xeons with dozens of threads, uh, or get up to uh, Xeon Phi and have uh, literally hundreds of hardware threads. Uh, but maintaining some consistency in the tools and software across all of that, it's a, it's a big challenge for it, but it's one that Intel's up for. You also spoke a great deal uh, this morning about uh, the, the speed up advantages when one goes strictly parallel versus trying to take advantage of, say, bigger hardware just for the sake of having bigger hardware, not writing specifically to the advantages of that hardware. Uh, what advice would you give, uh, say, a, a developer on Go Parallel who is curious about parallelism but still a little bit skeptical about sort of taking the Pepsi challenge, as it were? You know, I think the, uh, sometimes the most difficult thing to learn when you're thinking about parallel programming is what, what are the common uh, uh, cores of algorithms that work the best um, on parallel architectures. Uh, I think we get very used to the methods that we use in regular programming, the things we go back to, the, the we know what sort algorithms are, we know to use when to use a list or a stack or a queue data structure, things like that that are very familiar to us. And parallel programming, when it's new to us, uh, it, it's more challenging to know what are those basics. So. Uh, you know, some of us like to learn by just taking our program out and starting to attack it and throw things in and hack away, and I'm probably one of those. So if you're one of those sorts of people, then grabbing a book, looking at what TBB can do if you do C++, or uh, if you're more of a Fortran or C person, taking a look at what Open and P directives might do and just starting to change your program may be the way to go. 
Uh, if you're a little bit more uh, the type that likes to think through and look at uh, uh, algorithms and learn from others, uh, then I would recommend taking a look at uh, our new book, uh, Structured Parallel Programming, where we take a look at the problem and break it down into uh, uh, I call them best known methods or patterns that have proven their value. Things like map and reduce and uh, 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 pipelines and stencils. Uh, just knowing what those are uh, and realizing that it's understood how to make those operate in parallel may spark uh, you to say, oh wow, parts of my applications could be written that way or maybe they already are roughly written that way and that's an avenue into parallelism. So. Depends on which, which approach you like better, what type of uh, programmer you are, whether you just like to jump in and start changing things, or you, you like to learn a bunch of things and then apply it. Um, there are getting to be the opportunities now where uh, learning either way is, is well supported.